Welcome to this uh, GVN webinar, Forefront of Virology COVID-19 webinar series. And uh, as usual, before introducing Don Ingber, I just want to make a very short introduction to the Global Virus Network. Um, for each of the lecture, there are a few people, a few of the attendees who are not really aware of what the GVN is about. So briefly, the Global Virus Network has been created in 2011 by Bob Gallo and Billy Hall. Uh, the key word is that this is really a science-driven and independent network, and we all know how important this is, especially nowadays, working on all viruses, all human viruses, but obviously presently very much focused on COVID-19. And with the vision that uh, by gathering the best experts worldwide, we can really achieve results which are very complementary to those of national and international large institutions. GVN is about research with task force, with annual meetings, gathering the experts. It's about education and training, and in particular, and all of this is on the website the GVN Academy to nurture young investigators, uh, rising stars, to provide fellowships and uh, with a significant increase in our financial capacities, we have been uh, able to launch a series of programs on this and again, you have all the details on our website, but education and training of the next generation of virologists, education and actually, that's very related with what Don Ingber is going to present in a truly interdisciplinary approach. And it's about advocacy, providing again and again science-driven, independent advice to institutions, international, national, but also to industrial partners. And that connects with the last point, which is the very significant collaboration between GVN uh, with industrial partners, the recent creation of what we call the corporate GVN centers, and uh, all of this can be found on our website. I also want to draw your attention to the special page on our website on uh, the variants, on the vaccine with questions and answers, and you are most welcome to make remarks, suggestions on this web page. Having said that, it's really a great pleasure to welcome Don Ingber. Uh, Don has been trained, educated at Yale University, then went as a postdoc in a very famous uh, lab with Dr. Falkman at Harvard uh, for four years, if I remember correctly. And then he stayed at Harvard and became a professor, pathology, then surgery, then bioengineering. And actually now he is really the head uh, of uh, the WIS Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering. And, uh, and this is a, a fantastic title, in fact. Uh, and that what he is going to, to describe, and I don't want to go too much in detail, is really how by merging the fields of engineering of biology, you can really make very, very outstanding achievements in a, ver in a diversity of fields um, and, and obviously with strong impact on health. And so it's my great pleasure to welcome Don and thank you so much for being with us for this webinar. Uh, thank you so much. Let me see if I could share my screen. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, let's go here. You should be able to see that, great. Um, thank you, Christian, and it's my pleasure. Um, uh, so today, what I'd like to share with you is work uh, we've done at the VIS Institute um, in the area of leveraging human organ chip technology that we pioneered to enable discovery of antiviral therapeutics for influenza, COVID-19, and beyond. Um, you know, I will say that the Institute does everything from vaccines to therapeutics to diagnostics to nasal swab replacements and, and, and all of these are we've done for COVID, but I'm just gonna focus largely 
on uh, what we're doing in the therapeutic space today. So um, when we started the Institute uh, 2009, we were we, we kickstarted with the single, single largest gift in Harvard's history of $125 million. And, uh, but we were tasked with taking on high risk, but potentially high impact challenges. And the biggest problem I could see at that time was that the drug development models broke in. A big part of it is that it depends on animal models and you know, 75 to 95% of the time animal models are wrong when it comes to human clinical trials. So we set out to develop what have come to be known as human organs on chips. And the idea was to engineer microchips and these are microfluidic culture devices containing living human cells that reconstitute organ level functions, not cell or tissue, but organ level functions to accelerate drug development, replace animal testing and advance personalized medicine, and also to enable new insights into control of physiology and pathophysiology. And our first breakthrough was published in Science 11 years ago that was called a human breathing lung on a chip. Now, we're not trying to engineer a whole organ, these are, you can think of as living three-dimensional cross-sections through a major functional unit of the human organ. And in this case, we started by focusing on the alveolus. And the next uh, slide is a uh, animation that shows you how this works. So the, the chip is at the top right here. It's optically clear made out of flexible silicon rubber. If you cut it in cross-section, there are three hollow chambers, each less than a millimeter wide. The middle chamber is cut into top and bottom by a porous membrane, and it's coated with extracellular matrix. To create the alveolus chip, we have human lung alveolar cells on top, human lung capillary cells on the bottom, and we just recreate that interface. The trick is we have cyclic suction through side chambers. The whole chip is flexible, and so it actually can stretch and relax at the same rate and degree when we breathe in and out. We then can create an air-liquid interface on the top, and we could flow medium with or without immune cells to the bottom. And if we have capillary cells on all four sides, we've even been able to flow whole human blood without anticoagulants for hours. So if this were to work, it should replicate organ level responses. So imagine you have a bacterial infection. There's usually a tissue tissue signaling response of cytokines being produced, which activate the endothelium to express receptors like ICAM that now whole cells that were just flowing by out of the circulation, they stick, roll, diapodes, and engulf. And so now I'm gonna show you imaging in the device. These are fresh white blood cells. I know they're fresh. We took them out of my postdoc, Dan, huh? Uh, the endothelium is unlabeled, you can't see it. And the epithelium is behind the screen. So to begin with, quiescent endothelium, they're just flowing by. Now, if we have bacteria on the other side or cytokines, you can see, we can confirm ICAMs expressed, but you could see these cells being pulled out under flow, which is important because the initial adhesion is shear stress dependent. But you can now do any imaging that you could do in vitro or in vivo. So this is high mag, one white blood cell, finds a space between two endothelium there, finds the matrix filled pore, goes out of focus to the other side. You're now gonna see it come up through the epithelium by phase contrast. Now I'm gonna show you the white blood cells in red and the bacteria in GFB green and you now watch them being engulfed. So you just watch the entire human inflammatory response under this dynamic conditions in this little rubber chip. Now, I, I don't have time to go into all of the multiple publications we did with the alveolus chip, but let me just say that we've been able to model human diseases like pulmonary edema, um, uh, and, and we've, we've modeled drug toxicities even when toxicity has not been seen in animals. We've shown drug efficacy. We've discovered new therapeutic targets. There's even a drug in phase two clinical trials that in part came out of work out of these chips. It's also won many, many awards around the world. And believe it or not, it's in the Museum of Modern Art's permanent design collection. And it was recognized by the World Economic Forum as the top 10 emerging technologies a few years ago. Now we have integrated immune cells, as I showed you. We've also integrated stromal cells. And you could think of this as synthetic biology at the cell tissue and organ level. If you just have one or two cell types and you replicate a human clinical response, you don't need all that complexity. If you don't, you're missing something and you could add that back. Now, um, for today's talk, I'll focus a little bit more on the airway chip. So we, to, there was a lot of interest from pharma in, in, in airways because you have CO, you know, chronic obstructive pulmonary, pulmonary disease, COPD, asthma, really are small airway diseases. Viral infection can be both. 
Uh, so we took primary human um, bronchial epithelial cells. We put them on a chip under air liquid interface for three weeks. We feed them only through the vascular channel. And um, at the end of three weeks, these cells uh, are absolutely beautifully differentiated, the same ratios of all cell types as in human lung small airway. These are directional motion of cilia in the air, airway. And if we put fluorescent microparticles to look at mucociliary clearance, and I show you a real-time video here, they're moving at exactly the same rate as in our lungs when we're clearing mucus through the airspace. Now, I'm talking today because about four or five years ago, uh, NIH and DARPA came to us to see if we could develop uh, in viral infection models with the concern about future viral pandemics. And the focus initially at that time was on influenza. So we took the airway chip, and here you could see GFP influenza H1N1, and you could beautifully watch the process of infection in real time in these chips. And we could very nicely show that um, we can mimic uh, viral infection. We could see disruption of the epithelium. Here's ZO1 staining, cilia loss. We could even see effects on the endothelium, and in this case, injury in the endothelial side. We could show um, strain-dependent virulence uh, that mimic that in, in patients. We could quantify barrier function. We've even integrated electrodes so we can measure real-time trans-epithelial electrical resistance. Um, we can show that uh, the, these different strains have different tissue damage, like H3N, H3N2 produces greater cellular injury and disruption of barrier function, again, correlating with patients. And we could also replicate patient-specific responses. If we make chips, with airway cells from patients with COPD, they are about 10 times more sensitive to infection with each of, either of these viruses. Again, mimicking what's seen in, in patient population. But the most important and novel feature, I think, is that we really could model and analyze host responses to both infection and drugs. Obviously a big challenge with COVID-19 where the major morbidity and mortality is not initial viral infection, but the inflammatory response and cytokine storms and so forth. So here, for example, we are looking at, we can quantify by measuring the, the outflow of the vascular channel. Remember there's air on the top side, just like a blood sampling, we can measure, measure cytokines over time. And here you're seeing IL-6, IP-10, Rantis, and so on, and differences depending on the, the, the type of virus we use that again, scale with virulence in patients. We could also flow uh, neutrophils through the vascular channel, like I showed you in the movie. Not only watch them bind to the endothelium and migrate to the other side, but we actually watch them clear and coalesce the virus in this human epithelium in vitro. And finally, we could measure drug effects. And this is household Tamavir or Tamiflu. And what, what's important is not only that we can see an emission of, of viral load or reduction of viral load, but we saw the exact same 48 hour therapeutic time window that has been described in, in patients in which the drug is recommended for use. Now, uh, this is something that we, that's I think close to acceptance. We've also modeled human to human transmission of viral infection and spontaneous viral evolution. So we infect one airway chip in the presence of a drug like amantatine or also tamivir at a dose that's 90% effective. And then we take a droplet of fluid and like a mucus droplet and pass it from one chip to a new chip with the same dose of drug. And then we do this again and again and again. With amantadine, we found in eight passages, we were able to select for virus that spontaneously evolved to be resistant to drug. When we did gene sequencing, we identified um, five mutations, three of which were previously described in clinical patient populations, two of which have never been seen before. So this raises the possibility of, of seeing what, what, what viral strains might evolve over time in vitro. We did this with uh, Oseltamivir, and it took 28 passages, but we got resistant virus. And we actually even did double resistant viruses with both drugs, which is a little scary. But, uh, but I think this is a really interesting tool. Uh, we had data, transcriptomic data from past studies with COPD chips and actually exposure to cigarette smoke that made us 
focus on the proteases, surface proteases. And again, this is three years ago. Um, and we focused on, we, we explored the drug nefamistat, which is a uh, anticoagulant broad spectrum protease inhibitor. And in vitro, we could show it is a potent inhibitor of H1N1 influenza infection. I'm not gonna go on all the results, but the most important thing is we actually combined it with osaltamivir in our lung chips. And we found that we could double osaltamivir's therapeutic window to 96 hours, which I think is a really exciting finding for clinical use given the, the 48 hour, hour window that that drug is limited in patients now. Okay, so this is where we were when COVID-19 hit in January of 2020. Um, my virologist postdocs on the team are Chinese and they were following this in social media. Uh, I'm very you know, concerned. And within a day after reading the publication in January of the gene sequence for SARS-CoV-2, they engineered a, a CoV-2 spike protein expressing pseudovirus because we only have a BSL-2 lab. And they, they quickly just, uh, set up some studies with a HUH7 cell line that they had used in their other labs, you know, commonly used in virology labs. And they tested eight drugs that they identified, this is January of 2020, eight drugs they identified because they had some reported activities in related viruses like MERS, SARS, or Ebola. And these included um, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. This is January, 2020. All eight of the drugs they found demonstrated specific inhibition in the low micromolar range against the SARS-CoV-2 pseudotype virus, which is just measuring entry, but they all worked, whereas no activity in the, in the base VSAB backbone pseudotype virus. Now, um, as you all know, there are thousands of papers on repurposing drugs using you know, cell lines like Vero6, HU87, and, and most of them do not pan out. Um, so what we did is to move this to the human lung airway chip. The first thing we did is confirm that they express the relevant receptor in protease, ACE2 and TIMPRAS2, which they do at very high levels, because Vera6 cells and HUH7 don't, often don't have high levels of expression. Also, these our cells, human lung cells, have intact interferon responses where that's often compromised in cell lines. So the next thing we did is confirm that the pseudotype particles with spike protein bind to the ciliated cells in vitro on the chip, which is what you see here, as they do uh, in, in the um, lungs of patients. And here you see the cilia and the, and the double staining. Um, and then we uh, tested the drugs on chip. Now, because we can flow on these chips, we have shown in other papers that we could actually replicate drug exposure profiles drug, human drug pharmacokinetic profiles, drugs go up and down over time. We can mimic that on these chip and mimic regimen specific toxicities, for example. So to be, we, we didn't have that information for these drugs, but one thing we did is we flowed the drug at a clinically relevant dose and rather than bathing them in, in a high dose like most in vitro static cell culture assays are. So we flowed them at the reported Cmax. Now, when we did this, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine had no inhibition. Arbidol, verap, amiodarone, which failed in clinical trials, had no inhibition. We had three drugs out of this group that showed significant inhibition. And the most potent was amodiacrine, which is actually a related anti-malarial that's used, been used in Africa for, for many years uh, uh, for prophylaxis, particularly in kids. About this time, we got funding from DARPA to start a, a more integrated program that leveraged other technology in my group funded by DARPA on another program that uses computation, computational approaches for drug repurposing, starting with transcriptomic data from patients, uh, and then um, either using machine learning or using network analysis uh, approaches, but essentially can, can come up with with transcriptome wide profiles that need to be flipped to, to make them normal, if you like. And then going through drug databases, it will prioritize drugs that are likely to induce that state change and, and have a positive effect. And, um, and then we had a third pipeline that my group also developed, which is uses uh, proprietary molecular dynamics simulation approach we developed that actually models 
uh, proteins in the physiological, physical context of their microenvironment, not in solution, but you know, bound to membrane, interacting with other proteins, et cetera. Uh, and so the idea was to come up with, at least on this grant, FDA approved drugs to really do this quickly, to move them out of our lab into Matt Freeman's lab at University of Maryland, where he has a BSL-3, test them in Vero-6 or, or um, human um, A459 cells expressing ACE2, carry out work in organ chips with our pseudotype virus, and then eventually move it to Matt's lab uh, and Ben Tenover at Mount Sinai to, to get chips going in their lab. We then do pharmacokinetics with any drug we identify in hamsters, and then we Ben Tenover has developed a hamster um, COVID-19 model that's quite nice uh, that we would test this in. Now, just because time is short, the, the one compound that's gone all the way is that original amodiaquin we found in the lung airway chips. When we tested that in Matt's lab in Vera E6 cells with native infectious um, SARS-CoV-2, we can see potent inhibition of both the drug and its active metabolite in the low micromolar range. Uh, I think Ben tested this in his lab against human lung A459 cells. We've got even a better uh, uh, inhibition in the 600 nanomolar range with you know, three log reduction in viral reads. We then went to the hamster model. When we gave the hamster the drug one day before infection, we got significant inhibition where hydroxychloroquine in vivo had no effect. You could see this in histological sections of lung. We then did an animal to animal transmission model where we treated animals, healthy animals, and we then took an infected animal and put one animal in their cage. Controls 100% are infected within 24 hours. Here we got 90% inhibition. And then we did it in a treatment mode where we infected, this is intranasal infection, uh, and, and one day later we started drug treatment and we can see that there was a sustained inhibition uh, of, of infection even three and seven days out. And this drug is now in uh, clinical trials in 20 sites uh, across Africa. Now, um, we mentioned, I mentioned this molecular design approach and that we got DARPA funding because we had been starting to use it for influenza. And the idea here is to identify regions within the hemagglutinin molecule that are responsible for driving the physical unfolding, the dramatic biophysical structural alterations. And we're able to identify a region in a conserved region in, in influenza hemagglutinin that we believed from modeling would be a critical target. And we have developed small molecules from libraries uh, that we identified, uh, you know, initial set I'm going to show you um, what we found with these initial set, but we're also optimizing these using machine learning. And as you can see here, we can get um, compounds that have potent inhibition of H1N1. I think that was in MDCK cells. But we've also done this in human air, lung airway, and we could see reduction of viral load with H1N1. Um, th this is uh, by the M1 gene. We can see cytokine reduction can common can associated with inhibition of infection. But well, one thing that was interesting though, by targeting this site that's conserved on hemagglutinin, we didn't see development of any resistance to, to this drug. Whereas under same conditions, we saw rapid resistance to amantadine using the assay I showed you earlier. Now what's exciting, and again, we have not fully optimized this yet in terms of more and more potency, but the lead compound we have is equally active in the seven micromolar range against two different strains of H1N1, two different strains of H3N2, one strain of H5N1, and two different drug resistant strains that we evolved in vitro that are resistant to amantadine and also tamivir, all of which seven micromolar range and a, and a very high SI uh, in terms of difference between toxicity and efficacy. We are now getting down to the nanomolar range with the, with the next version of these compounds. Now with COVID-19, we got DARPA funding and also NIH funding. And so we have now um, moved to do something similar within the spike protein. We found a conserved region that is involved in spike unfolding after the cleavage inside the endosome, pH dependent, 
we can model all of this. The region is not in any of the variants. Those are all at the external site. This is more cl closer to the membrane. And with this, we use this iterative approach where we do, you know, testing in, in, in either, it, we're, we're doing testing with different pseudotype virus variants. We're then doing testing in native virus of CoV-1, CoV-2, MERS, et cetera, in Matt's lab. And then we're iterating the, um, the design. We're putting medicinal chemistry in for solubility and, and hopefully positive PK profiles. And then we're doing PK in animals to get this moving quickly. But just uh, early results um, at the left, our computational predictions of binding affinity and the better binding affinity at the left should give you a better activity. And that's exactly what we see in Vero 6 cells with SARS-CoV-2. We have the lowest IC50 with the predicted highest affinity uh, molecules. We've tested um, some leads in the organ chips. Um, this is a novel drug we designed. This is some of the repurposed drugs that we identified, um, all of which are active in, in the organ chip. But actually just today we got new results um, with a newly, with an optimized design of one of these compounds that works against SARS-CoV-1, SARS-CoV-2, we're just about to test in MERS, but we're now down into the 147 nanomolar against native CoV-2 in a BSL-3 lab with A549H, uh, ACE2 expressing cells, these are human lung cells. Very broad difference between inhibition and toxic effects. So we're, we're very excited. We're moving this to pharmacokinetic studies. Um, lastly, unrelated, but I think exciting, out of our influenza project, we carried out a CRISPR-based genome-wide screen to look for um, link RNAs that could be involved in host response to influenza infection. Long story short, we found some of these that were potent but when we analyzed the structures of them and carried out controls, it wasn't the link RNA function. We actually identified a new duplex RNA um, motif and a sequence motif uh, th that is a potent inducer of um, interferon beta, so type one interferon. And we've confirmed this in many models, but this is the airway epithelium in our lung airway chip. This is the alveolus epithelium in our lung alveolus chip. And we're talking, you know, here, here we have, you know, many fold increase in, in interferon beta. And um, we have now tested this in, against multiple viruses. And I should note that this says it's only 20 uh, nucleotides long. It doesn't it has 5-monophosphate or 5-prime-hydroxyl. It's not your usual candidate for being um, uh, stimulating this, in, this innate immunity response. But uh, we find that, and it actually has a very interesting mechanism of action, but it, we find that it, it um, is a broad spectrum inhibitor of viral activity. So in the influenza, H1N1, potent inhibition of in H1N1 in both the airway chip and human alveolus chip. Um, H3N2 we've done with H549 cells. We've done SARS-CoV-2 in ACE A549 cells. We've done MERS-CoV-2 in Vero-6 cells. We've done common cold virus, NL63 and LLC-MK cells. Potent inhibition, as you'd expect from stimulating type 1 interferon in, in all of these. And we have preliminary results and this is without optimized drug delivery, which is the problem with the RNA delivery through the lung. But just introducing this through the airspace, we have seen significant inhibition in both prophylaxis and treatment mode in the, in the hamster model. So we're, we're very excited because this is something that is you know, potent inducer, more specific of a type one interferon, more specific than poly IC defined sequence, 20 nucleotides, easily synthesized uh, and very, very potent. So overall progress on this, you know, I mentioned amodiacin now in clinical trials, multiple sites. We screened over 550 compounds in the Vero-6 assay. We actually identified over 65 existing or FDA approved drugs with IC50 less than four micromolar and seven below 100 nanomolar. Uh, 15 of these also had a below one micromolar in the human ACE2 A549 cells. Many of these are not yet in clinical trials. Uh, 
88 out of the 550 were predicted to be active by our computational algorithms uh, that, that, that were predicted are, are actually in clinical trials already, not because of us. And then we're now working on, um, we've got some exciting results about synergistic combination therapies where we have drugs FDA approved, well, drugs that are in late clinical trials that stimulate, uh, in, that modulate the, the over-churned inflammatory response. They suppress the bad inflammation while combining it with a, you know, an early stage antiviral like monopiravir or favipiravir. And the two of those seem to synergize uh, and so that's really, I think, where the future lies. Uh, to end, you know, I, I showed you the alveolus chip, but we also have the, I'm sorry, the airway chip. I mentioned the alveolus chip, but we have about 15 to 20 different human organ chips at this point. We've even linked them together to create a human body on chips and can predict human drug pharmacokinetics using it. But I just want to show you one other that might be of interest. Uh, you know the challenge with you know, vaccine testing and non-human primate models. Well, we developed a human lymphoid follicle chip that can basically recapitulate human vaccination responses in vitro. We literally take peripheral blood from patients, isolate B and T cells, put them at high density in a matrix gel in one channel, and just perfuse or superfuse through the other channel. And what you see is that you get spontaneous aggregation of follicle-like structures that when you give antigen, grow into germinal center-like structures that are CTLA-4 positive and have TMD cells. With, with antigen, you also get plasma cell formation. I should say that you, you don't see this in static chips nearly as efficiently, so you really need the flow. Um, if we, we then took these and we immunized them with commercial flu zone vaccine, and if we also integrate dendritic cells, we can see antibody switching in terms of specific IgG against the hemagglutinin and antigen in that vaccine on chip. We also could collect cytokines from the vascular channel. And uh, David Walt, by chance, had blood samples from patients who were vaccinated with flu vaccine. And we can get a very similar profile. These are two chips on top with high interferon gamma, IL-10, IL-2. And that's what you see relative to these other cytokines in these patients as well. And then now with both drug companies and with uh, Gates Foundation, we're now using these to test adjuvants and we can clearly see the effects of adjuvants. This is a um, squalene water emulsion adjuvant in, the, in these chips more effectively than in 2D culture. So to end, I have to disclose as a Harvard faculty member that um, I hold equity, chair the scientific advisory board and sit on the board of Emulate, which has commercialized these chips and have automated instruments to run them, which are being sold around the world. I know they're at the Pasteur Institute, they're, they're in Public Health England, they're at, at, at many sites. Um, I do hope that you guys try exploring these because I think they can be really valuable. We've used these with intestine chips for also with pseudotype virus, we've used these with, we can grow complex microbiome in direct contact with our intestine chip for five days, over 200 OTUs, and we get, and we have a healthy barrier throughout that time. Uh, so really open up whole new range of possibilities that you don't get just with organoids. You can measure transport, absorption, you can mimic drug pharmacokinetics, et cetera. And to end, I invite you to the website. Uh, the one thing I'll highlight is this, News item about sepsis detection is a technology out of my group, which are electrochemical sensors that are multiplexed with very high sensitivity specificity. You, on a, and a little handheld, you can measure quantitatively within 15 minutes up to about 10 different analytes. And uh, this has been licensed by IQ Global in combination with their transistor-based technology and is in clinical studies for COVID-19. Um, so uh, there's many other things going on. I, I invite you to the website. And with that, I am happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Don. That was really, uh, as expected, a, a great presentation, uh, really a great presentation, which shows the value of, uh, this, uh, of this approach. So now we are opening the uh, questions and answers. Um, so. You can, as Kevin has uh, mentioned in the chat, you can send your Q&A. 
we haven't received any uh, question yet, so I ask all the audience to feel free to write their uh, any questions to Dr. Ingeborg. Sure, and maybe I will start meanwhile. I, I really thought that, uh, I mean, all these uh, recapitulations of organs are, are really fascinating. Regarding the recent results with the uh, lymphoid follicle uh, recapitulation, so you really mentioned the capacity to investigate both the uh, B cells and T cells. And uh, so, I mean, one of the obvious questions is, have you started to test, for example, on uh, some of the uh, currently available vaccines? And uh, is there a difference between uh, different vaccines? I mean, without any advertisement, <laughs> I mean, do you see something? Have you started this? We have not. We have, we're collaborating with a major pharma who has given us a, a replicating mRNA vaccine that uses the same lipid nanoparticles that are used in Moderna and, uh, and Pfizer. And we could see, you know, nice uh, stimulation there, although those studies are just beginning, but we have not, we have not done that um, because no one's really asked us to do that. We don't have access to those vaccines or the funding to do that. But, um, you know, one thing that we are interested in doing is to make non-human primate lymphoid follicle chips and human and see if we can show that we mimic the species specific responses, because I think that would allow us to sh get convince people to go to human right away. Um, the FDA has uh, asked us to do this with lung chips. We're making we're working, we're planning to work with Simon Funnel at Public Health England uh, to make, uh, to get non-human primate cells to make lung chips uh, versus human lung chips to look at SARS-CoV-2. Uh, we've previously shown that we can mimic um, species specificity in terms of liver toxicity with liver chips. We made rat, dog, and human because all drug companies need to test their drugs in rat and dog. And we mimicked species-specific toxicities that have been observed over years. Um, the, the drugs came from two pharma companies that knew, had, knew the history. So, uh, but we have not done that because we, we, we're not funded to do that. We don't have access to those. I see there's one question here. What is the potential of the chips in yeah. neuroinflammation and neurodegenerative diseases? Um, we've made a human blood-brain barrier chip that recapitulates the, the barrier uh, you know, robustness of human barrier, which hadn't been done before. Uh, Emulate is now um, also uh, selling chips to study neuroinflammation that are built off of that. Clive Svensson and it, um, Cedar Sinai Medical Center has done this as well. So yeah, and we have a grant from NIH uh, with another group to, we, you can use IPS cells to make these. So we're making Alzheimer's chips with cells from patients with Alzheimer's, you can in, you basically have endothelium, that's human, you have astrocytes, pericytes, and you can integrate neuro, neuronal cells. So you can look at these for many, many ways. We have a major program on developing uh, shuttles across the blood-brain barrier for drug delivery, but you can also look at neuroinflammation and, um, and, and you know, the, 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 the blood-brain barrier is a, a neurovascular unit is a major site for inflammation that's involved in many diseases. So that is why we focus there. Thank you. By the way, I forgot something important to mention at the beginning is that uh, Don is now the head of a new GVN center and uh, uh, the uh, recognition of this uh, center within GVN has been a very very interesting uh, step forward. Um, do we have other questions? Oh, if oh. not, I may. Oh, please, please, please. Shinhei? Oh, no, we don't have any more other questions. Okay. No, I, no, I wanted to ask regarding the. Please, please, please. I was just going to say that um, I should mention that, you know, we have shown that. We've modeled um, uh, we've mo modeled viruses, uh, enteric viruses in the intestine chip, 
Um, other groups have been modeling, you know, various uh, vi vi types of other types of viruses and different chips. So th this is much broader than just respiratory viruses. So I, th I think it, we've also beginning to link the lymphoid follicle chip to intestine chip to be able to model mucosal immunity. Uh, we're also linking the lung chip inf infected with influenza to the lymphoid follicle chip to see, can we see induction of, uh, you know, a, 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 an immune response and, and antibody production. So there are lots of interesting things you could do, but this idea of it being synthetic biology at the cell tissue or organ level allows you to have mechanistic insight in ways you cannot do with other, other types of systems. Yeah, and to follow up on this regarding the intestine chips, uh, I mean, are you able to recapitulate, for example, the effect of some uh, pro or prebiotics on the microbiome? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so we're funded by Gates um, on a few programs that are both trying to understand microbiome effects on, on disease and also therapeutic probiotics. So um, we have a program on environmental enteric dysfunction, malnutrition, and there um, we, we literally get organoids, intestinal organoids from kids in Pakistan who have EED. They also have healthy ones. We break the organoids up so, and then plate them on the top channel, have endothelium on the bottom channel. We get beautiful intestinal villi. And then we can study microbiome interactions and we could show that um, a consortium of seven commensal microbes that have been shown to um, induce uh, a, a EED-like state in mice to do that on chip. Uh, we also can show that if we give nutritional deficiency with, with the organoids from these patients, their transcriptome looks much more like the patient transcriptome than either a healthy chip with, with uh, low nutrients or just a baseline organoid EED alone. We have another project with Gates around vaginal dysbiosis. We've made human vagina and cervix chips. They're, they're going to clinical trials with a consortium that they believe is anti-inflammatory and that can flip the dysbiotic state of a whole community of microbes. And there we can confirm that these consortia you know, suppress inflammation on these chips. So we can see the effects of positive and negative, you know, healthy and therapeutic and, and dysbiotic microbiome, absolutely. And you could also, we also published that you can very quickly use metabolomics Thank you. to, to uh, identify small molecules that mediate the effects of microbes in the, in the microbiome. There's a question here, how to test cellular immune responses using our chips. Um, you know, that's something that I just have a new postdoc who's worked on T cell differentiation. We're just talking about, um, you know, integrating NK cells, T cells, looking at T cell differentiation, for example, when linked to a intestinal microenvironment versus a lung microenvironment. Um, but you can, you know, any sort of assay you can do in vitro you can do in these chips. And often things you can do in vivo, you can do in these chips. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, that's great. Uh, you see, and I really hope, as you said, that uh, this presentation will stimulate uh, such uh, cooperation within the GVN and actually outside the GVN. Uh, so, I thank you really very much, Don. That was a great lecture. And thank you to all the attendees. And uh, we will welcome you for the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.